Greetings and welcome to my examination of the Jody Arias case. This is actually part two <clears throat> of a series, a series which I began several months ago when I was kind of gripped by the case and then dropped for various reasons. I got busy with other things. Uh, the story itself is just so dreadful, not to mention well, downright dirty. So I just kind of dropped the project and um, didn't really come back to it until a little while ago when somebody asked me where the part two was and if I was still going to do it. And then I sort of re-engaged with the case and here we all are. So some of my objectives for even doing this, I mean one might reasonably ask if the case is so dirty and dreadful then why uh, get involved with it again? Well. To answer that, I think it's a valuable exercise to attempt to answer the question of is this the chart of someone doomed to die prematurely? It touches upon uh, that age-old question of indeterminate free will versus strict determinism in the universe. Tangential to that is the consideration of what could have been done about this. Is there any way Mr. Alexander could have sidestepped his fate? Was it even his fate to begin with? Which leads to yet another question. What could a counseling astrologer endowed with uh, these techniques that I'm about to uh, use have done with Mr. Alexander? And to answer that question, I'm going to sort of create this hypothetical astro mage, this sort of astrology ninja, this astrology wizard whom I'll constantly refer to probably from here on out as our hypothetical Nostradamus style astrologer. You know, I like to joke around a lot that uh, getting a reading from me is sort of like going out to eat at medieval times. You know, you get a sort of period experience. Um, speaking of eating, if, if, if you are eating right now, don't. <laughs> or at least pause the video and come back after you've eaten because like I said before, this case is uh, inexpressibly disgusting and to to that um, I might I might add that it's kind of disturbing too so if one is at all squeamish about these uh, uh, about things like uh, murder and violence and aberrant sexuality then this is not the video for you so consider yourself warned I'm going to d discuss these matters in clinical terms but they are fundamentally uh, perplexing. So here we have Mr. Alexander's nativity. As you can see I've used whole sign houses. I do not exclusively use whole sign houses but for this presentation I'm going to use uh, this house system for the sake of clarity and simplicity and economy. Over here on this side we have his solar return for 2007. Now he died in uh, 2008 but it was shortly before the birthday so the 2007 solar return was the applicable solar return for his date of death so what sorts of topics are we going to cover uh, today well first of all this this whole story is preeminently a story of the third and ninth house axis right uh, Jody Arias as you may or may not recall, has the exact same ascendant as Travis Alexander, and so her whole sign chart is a replica of his houses as well. And just like uh, Alexander, she has a luminary in the third, ninth axis. She has the sun down here in Cancer. And of course, the theme of journeys and traveling is an important theme in this, in this narrative as well, in the case as well. Also, we're going to talk about the second and eighth axis because this is a lethal axis this is the axis of death we're going to talk about the houses which pertain to death which are the second the eighth the seventh and the fourth so this this is going to be something that one consistently picks up in my entire astrology project this notion that the fourth is a morbid house that's going to be something I consistently rely on. Now, it's not the, the main meaning of the fourth house. The main meaning of the fourth house is your family, your parents, your origins, and, and also your domestic life. But an important secondary meaning of the fourth is the end of life. 
Practitioners of horary will be familiar with this concept because they're accustomed to seeing the fourth house as the end of the matter. So, the second house might be a little bit more difficult to understand its lethality. Simply by being in opposition to the eighth, it's a place of death. But why is the eighth a place of death anyway? Because it is in aversion to the ascendant. It cannot aspect the rising sign. Here we're talking about sign-based aspects. Sagittarius cannot aspect Taurus. So it's a dark zone. That's why it's frightening. The sixth is also one of these dark zones, as is the twelfth, and surprisingly the second. So first of all, the second is associated with mortality simply by being in opposition to the eighth. But second of all, the second house is associated with mortality because it's in this dead zone. It's in one of these shadow zones relative to the ascendant. And things that are in here are outside the scope of our understanding, right? The twelfth house are those people who plot behind your back, although they smile in your face. If you knew who those people were, then they wouldn't be hidden enemies anymore. The eighth house shows what leads to your death. If you understood that, then you would avoid it. The sixth is your illnesses, among other things. If you, could, if you could foresee those, then you would avoid them as well. So these dead zones show things that sneak up on us. The second house is a little bit harder to justify in this scheme. And it, it is the best of these four houses, there's no doubt. But the ancient Greeks referred to it as the Gate of Hades. So it's a dark zone. And for this reason, planets in here, in addition to showing money and livelihood, can show advisors, people who help us to understand these dead zones, or people who help, who help us navigate through these dead zones, like lawyers. As you'll see later in the presentation, Mars and Gemini, among his other numerous significations, is a, a symbol for Mr. Mr. Martinez, the prosecutor, the lawyer for Mr. Alexander, representing Mr. Alexander. Um, an unfortunate side effect of this case is that Alexander's private life was made public. So we were exposed to his sexuality and, several, uh, and some several serious allegations and accusations were made against his sexuality. I'm not going to attempt to answer those, but we're going to explore his erotic dimension as well. And to do that, we're, we're going to use, among other things, the ninth parts. I'm going to also use the twelfth parts as well. So we're going to examine those uh, delineating techniques. I'm also going to talk about his longevity. So that's going to be a topic we get into. Um, in addition to that, while investigating his romantic life, I'm going to bring up the concept of a winner, a planet uh, that wins out over the other planets to represent a certain topic like marriage. So, let's begin. Oh, and also we're going to investigate his religion. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing that we want to know when it comes to understanding a longev the longevity of anyone and their personality and what they want out of the world is the ascendant. The first house, that's the house of life. It shows what a person's personality is like. It shows what they want out of the world, what they seek from the world. And with Taurus rising, we have someone who wants a comfortable existence. Someone who wants stability and order and luxury if possible. This person wants to be comfortable. They want to have a very good diet composed of rich foods that taste really good. Okay. Taurus is a fixed sign. It's earthy, so it wants stability. So, one of the main motivations for Taurus rising is security. Security of the body and security of the material circumstances of life. Money, property, security. Material security. Venus is the ruler of Taurus. So, she says something about uh, what Mr. Alexander's self-concept was like. Namely, it's Venusian. 
his self i his self concept is venusian fun cheerful i'm a cheerful person i like to have fun you know i like to have a lot of friends around me i like to be sociable so venus is in gemini that says a lot about him right i'm chatty i love conversation I want to try to be intelligent or I would love to be perceived as intellectual. But I'm using these Venusian methods in order to get material security. And here is the man himself, Mr. Alexander. The fellow looks so wholesome here. So wholesome. I don't know if anybody has actually listened to the court transcripts when his conversations with Miss Arius were, were, were played, but uh, listening to them, I, ha I found myself like looking around and chuckling uncomfortably. You know what I mean? I was alone. I was here all by myself, but I was looking around. That's how embarrassed I was. <laughs> I was personally embarrassed. I can't imagine what his family must have been feeling, or not to mention everybody else in the court. But here, he looks so wholesome. Only astrology can reveal what's beneath um, that, that wholesome exterior. And so here we see the first sign of trouble. The ruler of the Ascendant is an aversion to the Ascendant. She's in one of these dark zones, in other words. So by being here in Gemini, she cannot aspect anything at all in Taurus. She's trying to manage Taurus. She's trying to find an outlet of material security for Mr. Alexander, but she can't. Right? She's going to attempt to find material security through livelihood, a Geminian type of livelihood and money, money that's earned in, in a Geminian fashion through communication and, and making contact with others. She's going to try to find happiness through sec material security that way. But simply by being in aversion to the Ascendant, this tells us automatically that she'll never be able to provide the happiness that Taurus rising absolutely requires. I want to emphasize that I'm talking about Taurus rising here. I'm not talking about the Taurian sun. The, the motivations of the Taurian sun may or may not be very different depending on what sign is rising in that individual's chart. But I'm talking about Taurus on the Ascendant. It's motivated by material security. It needs material security. It needs it. And Mr. Alexander, because Venus is placed in the second, is going to attempt to find material security through second house means. But because Venus is in aversion, then there's this element of a lack of control, a lack of oversight. Right? which leads to uh, habit-based types of behaviors, right? blind spots, not having all the knowledge that one needs beforehand. Also, it can represent having to travel for things, like be, not, not like pleasure trips, but being displaced from your, from your home, either because you have to work or, or because you're forced to leave or something like that. But the important thing to realize here is that when the ascendant ruler is in the second, it cannot accomplish whatever the main motivation of the ascendant is. Right? Here's a uh, photograph of Mr. Alexander's uh, closet. Look at all those shoes. I, I, to me, this is like the, the archetypally quintessential image of, of Taurus rising. Not just the organization. But just the number of shoes. You know, I mean, I never think about these things. To me, shoes are like tires. <laughs> you know? I mean, I've, I think I've got like one, I think I've got like one pair. <laughs> I just never think about shoes. But this dude, I, I couldn't get over it. Look at all those shoes. Shoes for every occasion. Okay. Now, here's an interesting feature of the synastry between these two, or at least the chart comparisons. Miss Arius, uh, her. Ascendant ruler is in the same house, and it's also in aversion. So essentially, we have two people whose ascendant rulers are kind of blinded. Two people who are going at life in a blind way, riddled with uh, scripted types of behaviors, not having all the information they need to hand right then and there, and operating in spite of that, not having the full measure of knowledge and control. But for Miss Arius, the problem is even worse because the moon 
is also an aversion to the Ascendant. Moon is the exalted ruler of, Tor of Taurus. If Venus is knocked out of commission, if Venus cannot achieve the material security needs of, of Taurus rising, look to the moon, because maybe she can. For Mr. Alexander, she, she can. She's not only trining the entire sign of, of uh, Taurus, she's also trining the actual Ascendant degree. And this makes her very special for that reason. It, first of all, adds her as a method that Alexander would use to get material security. He, he would use lunar methods, lunar and Capricornian methods, right? Um, and also ninth house methods. This will be very important later. It's one of the only reasons why I'm investigating his religion later in the, in, in the uh, presentation at all. The topic of religion is important because it affects his sexuality. It affects his livelihood. And so thereby it affects his murder, his premature death. So his Taurean drives for security are going to be are going to be accomplished in a lunar manner. Now, because the moon is contacting the ascendant by degree, then this kind of shows the vibe that he emanates. You know what I mean? And so that has an effect on the tribe that he brings in. So he's going to see the moon everywhere. The world is going to be full of lunar opportunities, and he, for that reason, he's going to receive the moon, simply because he sees it everywhere. It's going to come to him, for better or for worse. And as you'll see later, it turned out to be worse. And this fact is backed up astrologically. So, here are a few significators of death. The eighth house itself that's what leads to one's death the seventh house is what actually uh kills one it shows it shows the the sort of sl slipping into darkness i hate to laugh it's i guess a stress reaction <laughs> how i respond to uh death you know it reminds me of this line from milton the devil can't stand to be mocked anyway the second house as i talked about a bit earlier a little surprising but hopefully the logic behind it is clear the fourth house, which is also a little surprising, but again, logical and, some, and, and a feature that I will consistently use throughout all of my delineations when necessary. Because again, it is not always necessary. It's not the primary, death is not the primary meaning of the fourth house. It's very much a secondary meaning, as is incarceration. And as you'll see later, the fourth house has a tie, along with the eighth house, to our, pro our previous existences for those who believe in reincarnation. Also, Mars and Saturn naturally signify death because they're the malefics. They naturally signify destruction. That's what they create. Mars, uh, for, for uh, Ptolemaic types of astrologers, uh, descendants of whom you see today, you know, they're always talking about electromagnetism and waves and things like that. Ptolemaic type, type astrologers tended to be scientists. They wanted to, wanted to est establish astrology on a rational basis as a branch of physics, as a science. And in so doing, they said that the planets dried and cooled and, and moistened and heated. They did things. And Mars destroys through his, his uh, heat and also his dryness. But Saturn destroys mainly through his dryness. Also, the Lord of the Eighth House is a significator of death. He represents death in every nativity. And of course, there is an Arabic part of death, and uh, it has a ruler as well. All of these, all of these topics, and many more, all of these uh, celestials, all of these astro astrologicals, and many more can be uh, studied to understand something about the end of life. Now, speaking of life, how do we judge that? How do we judge the longevity of a person or their life force? Well, the Ascendant, it's the house of life and its rulers as well. Notice that I said it's rulers, plural. The Moon and Mercury, um, in my opinion, they signify life or are significators of life because they signify consciousness. The Moon shows sort of our irrational animal intelligence, whereas Mercury indicates our more rational mind. The, pre the prenatal lunation, the full moon or the new moon which came before the birth of a native, this was thought to be a point of ensoulment. 
uh, one of the few areas of choice exercised by the incoming soul. Some of the uh, Neoplatonists and, and classical philosophers, they, they conceived of the moments before birth as, 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 a, as a time of choice. You, you would look at your life, you would choose a life, almost like you were a, a kid in a pet store. You would choose the life you wanted, and then you would take your choice over to the three fates, the three feminine gods of fate, the three feminine goddesses of fate who would uh, ultimately green light your choice or reject it. And then if they, green, if, they, if they gave you permission to take that life, then they would spin out the, the thread of life. Right? We might understand this in practical terms to be a primary direction, the arcus vitae, the arc of life. And then they clip it at the end. So, this prenatal lunation is a source of life. The releaser of the longevity. This was a planet referred to as the Hilaj in, in uh, Arabic writings. Uh, the Latin authors of Europe sort of bastardized it into the Heilig. But we can call it the giver of life. It shows uh, the basic life force that a person has. Now, the next planet we would find would be the giver of years because it quantifies the life force of the giver of life. And planets aspecting this giver of years can decrease or add. So, could the moon be the releaser, the giver of life for uh, Travis Alexander? The moon might be a logical choice, right? Um, however, she is not an aspect to her ruler, which disqualifies her, okay? Um, this automatically weakens the life force. He was born at night. Alexander was born during the night. So the moon is the authority of the sect, a very powerful force in the chart. She would be the first choice. And if she did signify the life force, then um, this could be the chart of someone who lived long. Right? Um, our next and really only viable option would be the part of fortune, which is a really cruddy option because it's in the house of death. It is, however, configured to its lord, Jupiter. Right? Now, Jupiter is in detriment, but he's also in a succeeding house. So he's going to be the giver of years. And this is arguable because he's not aspecting the part of fortune by degree, merely by a sign-based configuration. But he is succeeding, and for this reason would give his medium years, which are 45 and a half. He's assembled with Mars, and this is going to subtract the lesser years of Mars, which are 15. So this would time out the, um, the date of death. Okay, It roughly times it out. The part of fortune might be a more accurate giver of life even than the moon. So here we have Alexander's birth chart and the 2007 solar return. In the nativity, Neptune is in the house of death, so this orients him towards death. It makes him a significator for death, and he's going to carry this with him in all of his transits forever and ever, as long as Alexander is alive. Similarly, Jupiter is even more of a significator of death because he rules the eighth. And in the solar return, he's in Sagittarius, the natal eighth, which is in the fifth house of romances and sexuality. So this is a very malefic superimposition right here. Um, we, we might be fooled by the fact that Jupiter is in his sign and thus showing something supposedly good. But it, it's more, <clears throat> more powerful and, and present than it is good. It's simply saying that death exists and in abundance, too. Right? Uh, also, we can notice that Uranus and Neptune have switched places. So Neptune, signifying death, is now in the house of the partner and the assailant. Both, pe both types of people fall within the seventh house. Uranus, who natally signifies the partner, is now in the solar return house of death. Mars, which is in that rather morbid second house, is in detriment in Taurus. In the tenth house, very public, 
But also Taurus is the natal first house, the house of life. So this is basically a transit of a difficult Mars through his rising sign, through his house of life at the time of the solar return. Those familiar with my work will know that I use the cycle of uh, perfections, the annual changeover of, of the signs year by year, right? Where uh, the ascendant or some other point advances by one sign per year. And during the advancement, the sign that is being uh, released, the sign through which the point is advancing, serves as a motif or a theme for that year. And it does this sign by sign, year by year, until one turns 12 and then begins the cycle again. And it repeats that entire thing until one turns 24 and then it begins the cycle again, etc. Well, Mr. Alexander was at the end of his seventh house, Scorpio year which is rather lethal. He was about to enter into an 8th house year, which is also kind of scary. For those of us who aren't supposed to die prematurely, when we enter into these years that are tinged with morbidity, then sometimes the, what's called for is just simply depression or anxiety or surgery or something like that. But for him, it turned out to be lethal. Notice that in the solar return, his 4th house is rising. His 4th house is malefic because of the Saturn. In detriment. These planets that are in detriment show things that are going to disintegrate and fall apart at some point. The moon, she shows that his religion disintegrates. She shows that his quote-unquote wife will disintegrate and fall apart. Jupiter, Jupiter is showing that his life will fall apart and be disorganized somehow because he is associated with the Lord of Life, Venus. Here, we have the Lord of Life conjoined with the Lord of Death. And in the solar return, we have the Lord of Life squared by the Lord of Death. This is a definite, classic threat to life in that year. Knowing that he's about to enter into an 8th house year the next year, knowing that he's in a 7th house year, which his 7th house is kind of difficult, it's definitely not saying marriage. It's saying fights, incredible, in, incredibly intense emotions, violence even possibly because of the Mars component ruling it. Uranus is here. This is describing the, the, the quote-unquote spouse, the partner. She's going to be intensely emotional, and she's going to be shocking or shocked by everything. She's going, everything you do or he does is going to shock her. She's going to be in a continual state of shock. And this leads to his death because Uranus is in the 8th. You know, astrology, or, or at least this type of astrology that I practice, asserts that the end is in the beginning. So one's end is, is in the chart because the chart is your beginning. The beginning of anything contains its end nestled within it. And so... The early environment of Alexander's uh, upbringing, which was chaotic and tragic and tumultuous, served as a model that uh, sort of kind of grew, or a seed rather, that grew into the perverted, murderous domestic life that uh, brought an end to him when he was 30. Now, our Nostradamus style astrologer would have been expecting this guy to die ever since about 1997 or so because he entered into the Jupiter Firdar using another cycle of time lords. Uh, Jupiter was a time lord for a 12 year long period. And when he's a time lord, when any planet is a time lord, it's going to manifest what it promises. And Jupiter promises death in Mr. Alexander's chart by dint of ruling Sagittarius. Now, that alone would not be enough to predict death, but the Jupiter in this instance is in detriment, is also assembled with Mars, is also <clears throat> in a sextile configuration with a detrimented Saturn. So, here we have the solar return. We're already very suspicious of the Jupiter because we know that he's a time lord ever since 1997. 
and the time it, the time that he rules, the period that he rules in that system is going to be 12 years. So he's still the active time lord. And now he shows up in the solar return. In the sign that he rules, the eighth retrograde. Now this is this is bad. Squaring the the ruler of the ascendant of the nativity. This is bad. That ruler of the nativity is herself in fall, conjoined with the south node. As you'll see, uh, one of the one of the meanings I attribute to the to the nodal axis is publicity connecting us with the pub with a public record somehow. So this Venus is fallen, retrograde, right? and also uh, conjoined with the south node. It's a very difficult Venus to begin with, representing him, but, but now she's squared by the Lord of Life. So it's, all, all of this evidence is stacking up. Now this 12-year-long period ruled by Jupiter, which I'm referencing, is itself divided into, into sub-periods that are ruled by the other planets. And Saturn was the sub-period ruler when the event occurred, when the murder happened. So Jupiter-Saturn were the two pertinent uh, major time lords. And Saturn in the nativity is oriented toward death merely by being in the fourth like this. And being in detriment, this kind of orients them even more towards destruction instead of some other happier fourth house meaning. And now we can see in the solar return for 2007 that, that this difficult Saturn is not only rising, he's returned to the sign he had at the Nativity, which makes him even more powerful. Now, finally up here I say that Mercury in the 12th is the winner of marriage. What I mean by this is that Mercury ends up with the most points over all the marriage-like places. So we take a <clears throat> like we take the degree of the descendant, five degrees, four minutes, Scorpio. We take the degree of Uranus. You know, we take some other places that are important for marriage, like the degree of the lot of fortune. I'm sorry, the lot of marriage, which is at the end of Gemini for this native and its ruler, and on and on. And we make all of the points, all of the planets compete over rulership of these points, <clears throat> of, over these places, and the one with the most influence wins. And we use a pointing system to determine which planet winds up with the most influence over all of these marriage-like places. And Mercury is the one who winds up with the most points, which is very curious. Without using this system of determining the planet who wins in this kind of a competition over the topic of marriage, we would never, we would never associate Mercury with, with his love life at all. The bulk of astrologers would totally miss this. And such an omission would be a, a I don't want to say, um, I don't want to say a lapse in, in one's duty or malpractice even, but it would, it, it, would, it would be to the detriment of the person who is getting their chart read by such an astrologer. Now, the reason Mercury is so important is because it's, it, it lets us know something about the way the man thought about sexuality. Um, when Mercury winds up being the planet with the most influence over all the marriage-like places, then that's kind of a red flag for kink, which in itself isn't bad. Yeah, I mean, it's not Ill illegal, but Mercury in this kind of a situation, at least in the archaic literature, was often associated with sexual practices that we do in our modern times consider illegal. Now, that doesn't mean that Mr. Alexander is guilty of those sorts of illegal practices at all. It doesn't uh, offer proof. <laughs> now, here's where things get a little uncomfortable, right? Uh, and it's not my fault. I didn't ask for it to be this way. But it's still kind of interesting. Well, first of all, Mercury, when he's associated with the sexuality, can, can be so mischievous simply because it thinks all the time. You know what I mean? Um, it has the ability to eroticize anything. It thinks. This is what makes the sexual practices of such a Mercury to be a little unconventional at best. It thinks too much. Now, you remember how I said earlier that his moon in the ninth house in detriment means that his religion <clears throat> breaks down. You guys recall that? 
Well, in his relationship with Jody Arias, his religion broke down substantially. He used his religion to justify premarital sex with her. Um, actually, he used uh, alternative copulations in order to sidestep the restriction against vaginal copulation. That's the Mercury component. Um, his Mercury, in other words, shows, I don't want to say a preference, but a willingness to engage in that alternative copulation. The rules for this proliferate in the ancient literature. This was a real preoccupation <clears throat> with medieval European astrologers, with uh, the Persian and Arab astrologers before them. They wrote about it constantly. So they would have said, okay, Mercury rules the, the part of marriage, and Mercury is in an angular uh, house or sign, Mercury is pivotal. They, they referred sometimes to these angles as the pivots or the stakes. So Mercury is in a pivot. He rules the part of marriage and he is with the malefics. Uh, this, this would have been seen as at least a, a willingness, if not a preference, to engage in that alternative copulation. Now the interesting thing to me is that I'm sure that if Mr. Alexander ever did get married, which it wouldn't have lasted if he had, again, this is not the chart of a man who's going to be happy and mar who's going to be happily married. What he would have found is that, you know, if he if he had encountered his perfect Mormon spouse, then he would have been permitted to have a normal sexual intercourse with her because she was his lawful spouse. But in, in short order, six months, a year or so, he would no longer be satisfied by the vaginal intercourse. He would want the alternative coitus that he engaged in premaritally. And so normal intercourse would not have been satisfying to him. The Mercury, as Mercury as the, the winner over the entire topic of marriage, tells us this. Now, this is important because Mercury, by being the winner o over marriage, over that topic, Mercury becomes a significator of, of Jody Arias. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't Jody Arias resemble a mercurial type of person? Slender, with a, a, a changing appearance, blonde one moment, even cute, but then mousy and brunette with glasses the next in court. You know, two different types of Jody. So she's a mercurial type of person. Mercury is in, in, in uh, obviously, the sign with this difficult Saturn. Mercury is also in the terms of, of Mars and in, in Leo, which confines Mercury, Jody, to a Mars-like effect, a Mars-like concrete product, a Mars-like tangible harvest, something you can touch, right? So it's inclined to fight. Now this is very interesting. Right? Mercury was directed to the superior square of Jupiter on the 22nd of May 2008. Okay, And Mr. Alexander was murdered less than two weeks later. So, what do I mean by directed? Well, first of all, the square ray of Jupiter falls at 25 degrees 38 minutes of Virgo right around here. So by primary direction, Mercury was moved to that spot on May the 22nd, 2008, using the, deg uh, the degree for a year measure. Now, not to get too technical, but one has to convert these simple degrees into degrees of ascension. In other words, they're not really degrees on this wheel that we're looking at here. They are degrees on the celestial equator. So they don't, norm, they don't add out to a simple and clean 30 degrees per sign. It's like Virgo is going to have more than 30 degrees. So it's going to be one year of the special degrees that equals a year of life. So the movement, this primary direction, brings Mercury, the winner over the topic of marriage, to the square ray of the Lord of Death. Now, he didn't die right then. 
obviously. Those who are accustomed to working with transits are probably expecting point-based events where the transit occurs and boom, something happens. This isn't like that. This is Time Lord Astrology. Um, there are, think of all the things that happen to you which are not point-based events, right? Um, like when you're recovering from appendicitis, having your appendix, ta appendix taken out, or you know that one year in college. You know what I mean? There are plenty of, plenty of events in life that are kind of dragged out. And, and these Time Lord systems are, are really speaking to that kind of experience of life. So why, what it means when an important significator like Mercury... And in his case, it's not the truth for everybody that Mercury is the winner over marriage, but just for him, when this special Mercury is advanced and, and, and directed using a primary direction to the square ray of Jupiter, then there's a certain season that the native enters into in, in that particular dimension of his life. There's a certain season that obtains. It's not a point-based event. It's kind of a global environment for the native, and the transits are setting that off. Now the transits have greater meaning, don't they? When they are considered within this matrix or framework of, of Time Lords. So once that happened, once Mercury was directed to the square of the Lord of Death, then Jupiter represents actual people who are entering into to Travis's life. Mercury is more like a, an internal state of mind regarding the spouse or regarding his partner. And of course, on another level, Mercury shows an objective external reality as being Jody herself. But in this primary direction with Jupiter, when they are time lords, then Jupiter is going to represent the actual people who come into his life and Mercury is going to represent a certain frame of mind. One that's kind of dirty, too. No, let's talk about the ninth parts, the Novena Ria, and the twelfth parts, the Duodena. I'm very fond of these. I use them routinely in my practice. So, <clears throat> how are we to understand them? Well, the twelfth parts are twelve divisions of two and a half degrees apiece in each sign, and they replicate the entire zodiac within the sign. It's a zodiac within a zodiac. And they act as a gate or a door that let uh, some other influences enter in through the planet's expression. So, for example, and one, one uh, very easy way or one useful way of dealing with these twelfth parts is through the deacons of the signs. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a little trick to, cal to swiftly and rapidly calculate 12th parts and 9th parts. The secret is to use the deacons. Right? So, each deacon has 10 degrees in it. Since there are 12 12th parts, then there are 4 12th parts per deacon. Right? So, the ascendant at 5 degrees and 4 minutes is in the 3rd 12th part, the Cancer 12th part. Right? We can count it. Zero to two and a half degrees is Taurus, the first twelfth part. Two and a half to five degrees is Gemini, the second twelfth part. And then five to seven and a half degrees is Cancer, the third twelfth part. The third twelfth part of Taurus is Cancer slash Taurus. That's where his ascendant is at. What this means is that he's going to have a Cancerian subtone to his, his appearance, his expression. It's going to have a Cancerian subtone. So, to outside observers, he might actually appear Cancerian somehow, which is to say uh, he might be very concerned about you. He might seem caring at first. He might even physically look like a Cancer, a perception which would be aided by the moon's trine to the ascendant degree. By trining the ascendant degree, the moon would sort of be imprinting her, her uh, physicality upon Mr. Alexander. But this twelfth part of the Ascendant allows this Cancerian influence to enter in, enter in through the back door, as it were. <clears throat> and, so, and so he would have had a Cancer-like expression. 
desiring intimacy, being emotional, having some emotional intelligence and refinement. Right? Maybe even being a little needy sometimes, depending on who you are. If you're Jody Arias, um, then there's not going to be neediness. But if you conform to the strictures of femininity up here, elevated religious woman, then um, for sure he will need you then very much because then you would be linked into his livelihood because his religion is, but I'll have more to say about that later. What about Mars? What 12th part is he in? Well, first of all, at 7 degrees, 21 minutes of Gemini, he's within the first deacon. He's within the first deacon here, so we know that he's in one of the first four 12th parts in Gemini, which would include Gemini itself, then Cancer, then Leo, and Virgo. So he's in one of these four. We know it's not the first, because the first, Gemini itself, goes from 0 to 2.5 degrees. Cancer goes from 2.5 degrees to, to 5 degrees. And then Leo goes from 5 degrees to 7.5 degrees. He's in the third 12th part of Gemini, which is the Leo-Gemini 12th part. Now, because it's the third 12th part away, then it has a third house kind of a meaning. Journeys. Mars represents cutting, stabbing, piercing, blood. And now we can... I uh, bring in journeys along with that. <clears throat> the third, uh, twelfth part falls within the fourth of the entire chart itself. Fourth house has some mortal, morbid meanings, and plus it has the bad Saturn there and that kinky Mercury. What about Venus? What's her twelfth part? She's in the final deacon of Gemini, so we know that her twelfth part is going to be one of the final four signs of the zodiac relative to Gemini. Right? Which is going to be Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, or Taurus, one of those. The first twelfth part she could possibly occupy would be the ninth twelfth part, corresponding to Aquarius, 20 degrees to 22 and a half degrees. But she's in the uh, tenth twelfth part, from 22 and a half degrees to 25 degrees. So she's in the Pisces twelfth part, related to this lethal, uh, accidentally malefic. Jupiter. A word on accidental malefics. They're going to come at you appearing like benefics because that's what they are. That's what they want to do. Jupiter wants to bring forth wisdom, peace, abundance, etc. Other things. So he's going to represent something very good for the native. But because he's accidentally malefic, then the evil he represents is going to sneak in. Now as for Jupiter himself, um, 25 degrees to 27 and a half degrees is the 11th 12th part from Gemini, which corresponds to the Aries 12th part. And that's the 12th house. It's Aries, which is violent, or can be violent, especially in this context. It's bringing in an Aries. The Lord of Death is in the Aries 12th part, bringing in an Aries energy through uh, the back door, as it were. What about the planets in Leo? Let's look at Saturn. Okay. Um, first of all, he's in the middle deacon. So that excludes the first four twelfth parts, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio. It excludes those. And it excludes the final four twelfth parts, which would be in the final deacon. Right? So it, it excludes those. So it's in those middle, those middle four. Right? Sagittarius through Pisces. So... Since Saturn is in the middle decanet of Leo, then <clears throat> we can begin the count from the fifth twelfth part, which would go from uh, 10 degrees to 12 and a half degrees. That's the Sagittarius twelfth part. He's not there. Then the sixth twelfth part, which would go from 12 and a half degrees to 15 degrees. Nope, that's not it. Then the seventh twelfth part, which goes from 15 degrees to 17 and a half degrees. Nope, he is not there. He's in the 8th, 12th part, 17 and a half degrees to 20 degrees, right? The Pisces, 12th part, ruled by Jupiter, the Lord of Death. But also, it's the 8th, 12th part, so something lethal is entering in through the back door with regard to this Saturn and, and the 12th part that he's in. So you get the picture. Mercury is in the final 12th part of Leo, the 12th, 12th part, the Cancer 12th part, which is the third house, Journeys, right? 12th 
the twelfth twelfth part, the twelfth of anything, signifies mistakes and enemies. So you get the picture. Look at Uranus. Uranus is also in the third twelfth part. All right. Strike that. The fourth twelfth part. All right. So the fourth twelfth part, the four signs from Scorpio would be Aquarius. Now Aquarius is an air sign. It has to do with uh, your social life and contact with other people, among other things. So this Uranian shock, which generates intense emotion, Scorpio, is going to have as its cause and root some kind of social origin. Something in his social life and the way he interacts with others is going to, is going to play into this Uranian expression of the seventh house. Look at the moon. She's in the third twelfth part of Capricorn, the Pisces twelfth part. So she signifies a third house kind of a meaning as well, journeys. That theme of journeys is very important. It was important legally because the prosecutor had to use that in order to prove premeditation. She, had, she lived in Wairica, California, Northern California. Mr. Alexander lived in Arizona, so she had a drive of several hours. Explaining her whereabouts in, that, in, in the town where he lived, you know, that, that was a big deal. She had no business being there because she lived in Wairika. So this theme of journeys is, is vital to the, to the entire narrative. Now let's talk about the ninth parts. Again, we can, we can use the, uh, the deacons to help us out here. Because just as there are four twelfth parts in each deacon, which would add up to 12 total for the sign, there are going to be three ninth parts per deacon. So there are nine ninth parts total in a sign. Right? Nine ninth parts. So, each ninth part is three degrees, twenty minutes apiece. The moon is in the second ninth part. The way we calculate these is we start with the... Uh, the planet which rules the cardinal sign of the element we're in. So that would be Saturn. The first ninth part belongs to Saturn in Capricorn. The second sign after the cardinal sign of the element, that planetary ruler would rule the second ninth part. So the moon showing Mr. Ale Alexander's um, secret desires is in the ninth part of Saturn. So the ninth part of the moon, rather, showing those secret appetites belongs to Saturn. The secret appetites are Saturnian. Saturn is in detriment, the fourth, etc. It represents something difficult. His appetites are difficult. Now, the twelfth parts, as you saw, are largely sign-based, whereas these ninth parts are planet-based. And for the ninth parts, the main one to look at would be for the moon. Moving on. Looking briefly at some of Miss Arius's uh, twelfth parts and ninth parts, we see that her ascendant casts, a, or is in the, the sixth, twelfth part of the ascendant, Libra. Undoubtedly what's responsible for this sort of creepy, manipulative vibe that she gave off to so many people. Right? Her son... Her son and Mercury, remember, Mercury is important because he's the marriage significator for Mr. Alexander. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, our hypothetical Nostradamus-style astro-mage from the Renaissance or the medieval period would not have performed this calculation to arrive at a winner of marriage. He simply would have looked at the sun instead. Right? So he would have seen the sun as a significator for Travis. Now the sun is in the seventh 12th part, 15 to seven and a half, 17 and a half degrees. The sun is in the Capricornian 12th part. So since it is in the 7th 12th part, it brings in uh, this meaning of relationship because the 7th sign from anything involves interrelating. And because the 7th 12th part happens to be the ninth house, Capricorn, it brings in the notion of going on a journey, a Capricornian Saturnian journey. Now, interesting, interestingly enough, this entire ensemble here in Cancer describes perfectly the murder of Mr. Alexander because we have the man himself in the shower, Cancer, and there are pictures being taken. Mercury. Look at this, Mars and Saturn in the fifth of romance. So this automatically tells us that the fifth house topics of children, romance, pleasures, 
this is going to be the source of the greatest harm and evil and detriment in her entire life. It's going to be the source of great difficulty. Mars rules the twelfth of prisons and the house of marriage. Right? And his twelfth part, we can tell automatically because he's in such late degrees, is the twelfth, twelfth part of Virgo, the Leo twelfth part in the fourth house, which is rather morbid. But the twelfth of anything signifies mistakes, enemies, and things of that sort. Now, this consideration of Mr. Alexander's moon is central to understanding his entire life in psychology, is central to understanding what happened to him. It, it speaks directly to the question of how faded he was. Now, I'm convinced if I were his astrologer, I'm convinced he would be alive today. I would have picked up on the mercury, which not only brings in some harmful aberrations into his sex life, it also allows him to cunningly sidestep the uh, the dictums of his religion with this rather bizarre loophole where if one engages in alternative coitus with one's partner then it is not a violating the, the religious law mercury allows that kind of cunning rationalization now if I were speaking to him, I wouldn't necessarily go into all of this. I wouldn't, in other words, bring up what kind of coitus he likes, alternative or conventional or otherwise. I wouldn't have even brought up the topic, but I would have uh, gently probed. I would have noticed this huge contradiction because <clears throat> here is obviously a man who desires marriage very much, but who cannot get it. And so I would have known there was a, an extraordinarily potent disconnect and that here we have an individual who's going to have to uh, shuffle around his values in life and he's going to have to balance and temperate his behavior if he expects to get what he wants. Now, how predestined was he to die? Pretty strongly. Uh, all I can say uh, is that by predicting that he would be murdered by his lover, I'm essentially saying that his chart shows that he has the, uh, the sort of character that would uh, land him in a position to be murdered by his lover at such and such a time. A time that would be uh, generated by time lords, primary directions and things like that. Solar returns, an amalgam of these predictive techniques. That's all I can really say. He's got, I would say, Mr. Alexander, you have got this sort of character that is going to get you severely hurt by your partner. I wouldn't scare the guy. That crosses an ethical boundary, not to cause unreasonable fear. I would have definitely have rec recognized <clears throat> the lethal signatures of his love life and erotic dimension. And I would likewise have recognized the gulf between his er erotic wiring and his religion, which I'll get to in a bit. But what I want to point out now is that all of these subjects are sort of crystallized by his moon because it's feral. Notice, I've taken out the outer planets because our Nostradamus-style astrologer would not have had access to them. And also because they blur the configuration. They don't count towards it, although we can factor them in if we want later. But for now, I want to bring this configuration into stark illumination. I want it to be very clear. None of the seven traditional planets can see into Capricorn. They are all in aversion to Capricorn. So this moon is disconnected, cut off from the light of the other planets. She's feral. She's wild. This is not something you see every day. Not at all. What does it mean? Well, the tradition gives us abundant vocabulary for understanding this rare condition. Some authors refer to it as feralitas, which means literally wild, but we might understand it to be undomesticated. So this tells us an, an enormous amount of information. First of all, we have a man who wants marriage. We understand this from his writings, but he has the temperament to desire partnership. And yet his moon, signifying universally his wife, is undomesticated. His moon, indicating his animal instincts, his emotional needs, is uncivilized, undomesticated. 
So any astrological therapy or work with this individual, and he would need conventional therapy too, no doubt. One of the astrologer's responsibilities would be to broker a therapy session for this, in, for this man with a licensed therapist. But astrologically, what we can do to help him is to start nudging and probing and touching upon this disconnect, bringing it into his awareness, and then the more malefic indications of the chart could be satisfied in more innocent ways. We could take a knife, stab, and convert it into a flea bite. Now let's look at, the, our, at our next vocabulary term, alienatio. This has a different sense. It brings in the notion of loneliness. So we can know at once that this is a very lonely man, and we can know again that the woman signified by the moon is lonely as well as feralitas, uncivilized, wild. Because the moon is at once saying something about him because she trines the ascendant degree and his religion because she's in the ninth house. But the moon universally signifies the wife. And I use that term loosely. For our purposes here, we may understand Miss Arius to be the wife, even though they didn't have a, a legal marriage contract. So when I make reference to his spouse or his wife, I'm talking about Miss Arius. They certainly shared one of the most intimate relationships you can possibly share. If, if, you, if you get knifed to death by somebody, I hate to say it, but that's kind of an intimate situation. So she's alienated, lonely. Right, now this brings in a notion of destruction, annihilation. She's crazed. In other words, the moon is cut off from the light of the other planets. So she represents something and someone who is unconnected, who is not tied into the normal civilizing foundations of society. There's a lack of connections between this person and others. Now, now here I'm talking about the moon as a, a symbol of a, of a specific female in his external objective reality, Miss Arius unconnected to others. She certainly had issues uh, connecting to his standard group of Mormon friends. That might be seen also from the detriment of the moon in Capricorn, right? So she represents something that's going to disintegrate, something that's going to be smashed into nothingness later. She represents something, in other words, that does not have the full measure of existence necessary to, exi to survive. So she can't fit in. She's not making connections with others generally, not just with his friends, but she represents something isolated. She herself is somehow emotionally isolated from others, maybe even from the rest of humanity. We get this from the ferality and the wildness of the moon, the moon being void in course. This is what our last word here means, kenodromia. It's a Greek word. It means empty, of course. The moon is isolated. Now, feralitas wild. It also means, you know, having some qualities that are, that are kind of hidden, that nobody knows about. You know what I mean? Something that's not really apparent to, to everybody else. That's what's so wild about her. And certainly, I don't think Mr. Alexander comprehended, at first, the danger he was in, and he may never have comprehended the danger he was in. So our first two vocabulary words give us the idea of being lonely, isolated, possessing hidden qualities that nobody else sees, lacking connections, etc. This other word, abolitio, has the sense of severing ties, kind of like being absolved also, being <clears throat> cleared of a formal charge. Certainly Miss Arius was not acquitted. By no sense, but she acquitted herself, no doubt. During that long drive from Wairika to Arizona, she certainly acquitted herself. And you know what? Maybe Mr. Alexander acquitted himself too. One can get a sense of of this process of, of abolitio, um, acquitting oneself from both parties. Right? There's also the sensation there's also the sense of, of again parting ways cutting ties, not just with you, but with all of society. That's how I, I've had it up to here. That's how angry I am. Now I'm parting ways with all of the rest of sane humanity, and I'm going to do something radical. I give myself permission to do that. I've acquitted myself. 
so now I can let my wild nature shine through. And I chose this image because I think it really symbolizes uh, his moon very aptly. This feral, wild moon. Nothing is helping it, but nothing is blocking it either. Now, let's examine the topic of his law. And, and by law, I don't mean the, the, the earthly, terrene legal code. I'm talking about his, his behavior, his behavioral code, his religious law. What the ancient texts referred to as a dean. Now, the dean, the law, it's not the same thing as a belief. We might understand belief uh, to be a form of uh, what the Eastern philosophers call trishna, clinging, wishful thinking, in other words. You know, this idea that you're going to die and go to heaven, you know, get laid by a bunch of hoodies. Or, you know, inherit some kind of celestial real estate where there's, you know, a river of milk. I don't know who would want to drink from such a river, but there would be a river of milk there and the streets would be paved in gold and all of this. Clinging. <laughs> Wishful thinking. A dean is different. It's what one does. It's a lifestyle. One doesn't necessarily even have to believe in the dean. But it's what one does. It's a code that regulates your behavior. Muslims abstain from eating pork. They wash a certain amount of times a day. They face Mecca when they pray. Jews wear yarmulkes. Male Jews wear yarmulkes. They also, the more orthodox among them, wear other um, pieces of apparel called tzitzis. And, and there's a whole slew of other impingements upon the Jew's behavior. That's his dean. We can understand what a person's dean is from their ninth house from its rulers. Oh, and here, here is the uh, Hebrew word for deen. It's the same word in Arabic, by the way. <clears throat> One's law. We can understand an individual's deen from the ninth house, the planets that are in it, and planets that are configured to it. So, looking at, at Mr. Alexander's ninth house, the moon is in it. She's saying something about his deen. She's saying something challenging about it. It's disorganized. It falls apart. Right? Because she's in detriment. But also there are planets looking into it. We know Pluto is here. <clears throat> I took him out, but we know he's there. So he's casting his square ray into it. saying so That's saying something. right? N none of the other planets really aspect or look into his dean. That's significant. Maybe if there were some intervention by one of the seven traditional planets, <clears throat> then he would have been able to have adhered to his personal code a little better. Right, so we look at the planets that are in it. We also look at the rulers of the ninth house. In his, in, uh, his case, we're going to look at Mars as the exalted ruler and Saturn as the domicile ruler. And then finally, we would examine the mode of the sign that's on the ninth. And lastly, we might look at the part of religion and its ruler. <clears throat> We'd also want to look at Mercury as well to get a, a kind of a grasp for the person's mental processes. So this ought to be interesting. We already have an idea from this native, Mr. Alexander, that his sexuality is troubled. So looking at his religious expression ought to be very enlightening and revealing. We see the moon signifying religion in a spotty, disorganized way that's prone to breaking down. So <clears throat> we look at the rulers of the ninth house, Saturn in the fourth, so that's linking the ancestors to, to religious expression. And then Mars in the second, connecting his livelihood and money to his religion. Right? And indeed, the moon who is in the ninth is trining the ascendant. She's supporting his life with religion. <clears throat> and this man was a successful network marketer. One can almost wonder how that could possibly happen. Somebody has to make money doing it. But how? So his chart is actually interesting from that perspective alone. His part of substance is up here, by the way, in Aquarius, showing um, uh, the source of his income from human beings. That's probably a match for network marketing, as is these planets in the second. But my point here is that his religious contacts paved the way for his success. 
who he knew in the Mormon church helped him tremendously. Helped him a lot. So his dean, it's wrapped up in his material security, and we know from his rising sign that material security is paramount. Mess with his material security in life, and he will definitely take radical corrective measures. So the religion is very important for that reason alone, and yet it's spotty. It breaks down. Because there's a cardinal sign in the ninth house, this represents having doubts about the religion. A cardinal signs, we might think, are turning constantly and transforming constantly the planets that are in them. Representing, instead of a fixed, continuous adherence to a religion, to a dean, instead, something that is spasmodic changing all the time you know something uh that represents doubts that he has about his religion right. now his part of religion turns out to uh, fall in Vir virgo so mercury unsurprisingly rules it now additionally certain planets again are going to be important just because they rule the ninth house one of these is saturn now, as a significator for religion universally, he usually signifies Judaism and people who dress in black. But also, one encounters in the ancient literature this idea that Saturn can show people who think that they're holier than God. And who, other than someone who thinks he's holier than God, would come up with, with this rather kind of sleazy workaround to the dean, you know? This clause that allows one to sidestep the restriction against premarital sex by engaging in extravaginal copulation, alternative copulation. Someone who does that must consider himself a higher authority than the entity which issued his own dean. Mars, as a significator of the dean, usually represents dissenters, people who transgress the dean. And interestingly enough, when we combine all of these testimonies with the fact that Jupiter, a universal significator of Christianity, is in detriment and assembled with the malefics, etc., and on and on and on, then when a Jupiter goes really, really bad like this, we can know we're dealing with someone who, it, for lack of a better word, is a hypocrite. Now, let's talk a little bit about his karma, which is related to a Hellenistic concept, a Hellenistic Greek concept called ananke, necessity. Karma and necessity. The philosophical underpinnings of traditional astrology do not necessarily uh, endorse the idea of reincarnation. There's just this notion either that the planets are agents in 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 the in God's universe and are are doing things to enact God's plan, or there's this idea that the entire universe itself is kind of like this sort of fiery divine intelligence that is active, right? But the notion of reincarnation isn't necessarily built into the ideology. However, um, a lot of people do believe in it. And, you know, if it's possible, if it happens, then there might be some a record of, of anterior existences in the birth chart. There might be some record of your previous lives. And this part of the analysis is purely speculative. There's no doubt about it. But it certainly makes sense, and I feel it helps to unify the overall messages and themes we've identified in this chart. So... First of all, he has fire in the water houses, and he also has Saturn in fire. So this, to me, indicates a mischief with the fire element in previous existences. A misuse and abuse of power and his identity. And so in this existence, remember, remember my earlier yarn about the, the soul's existence prior to birth, where it kind of gazes down at earth. The ancients, some of the ancients believed this. The soul gazes down at the earth like a little kid looking into a, a bin filled with puppies and says, I want that one. And the fates approve it or reject it. Why would Mr. Alexander choose such a maltreated puppy as this? Well, there's this, again, notion of karma 
and necessity. In his past lives, speculating here, in his lineage of previous existences, then he was liable and prone to take advantage of his great identity, signified by the fire sign. The fire signs are the royal signs. He took advantage of that to abuse people. That's the speculation. And he chose this life to exculpate himself of that karma. This life perhaps was an Ananke. As a counseling astrologer, what could I have done? If he were receptive to these ideas, then I might, have, I might advance the notion that, hey, you know what? You can bleed off your karma in other ways than this. But that's, again, that's speculation. Saturn represents agnoia, ignorance, the lack of knowing. Right? The moon represents pronoia, vision. And again, his moon, the instrument of vision and pronoia, is wild, unconnected from the other planets in the chart, unconnected to the other planets in the chart. Now, interestingly, Jupiter and Neptune seem to offer ways out through the finances because these are sources of grace, sources of getting good stuff, getting uh, rewards, spiritual rewards, without having deserved them. This is a Christian concept, the concept of grace. Or to say the, I should say maybe it was a concept that was heavily relied upon by the church. And Jupiter and, and Neptune would be significators for that in these financial houses. Right. Now these aspects between the planets might represent uh, specific um, streams of incarnations. For example, the sextile between the bad Jupiter and this Mercury, <clears throat> you know, that might represent... Um, you know, two different streams of incarnations that would blend in a rather harmonious way. You know, that's one way to look at the aspect when it comes to judging past lives or, or, or reincarnation and karma and things of that nature. And I also have here a reference to the psychoid, which is a, ter a term coined by Jung, I want to say. And that's the moon. The moon, in many ways, is sort of where the rubber hits the road. She represents the intersection of all of these loftier uh, cosmic influences with the person's actual body. And again, his moon is troubled in so many ways. Now, this is a very interesting thing to look at. Who are the lawyers? <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, I said that the lawyers um, are in the second house because they are our advisors, advising us and guiding us through these dark zones. So Mr. Nurmi, who was the lawyer for Miss Arius, is shown by the moon when he represented her. He was an orotund, corpulent fellow, a fine lawyer. I mean, you know, he knows his trade. His interaction with Miss Arius, I think, was detrimental for him. But the interesting thing is that he, after the trial, he developed cancer. And this, I think, can be seen from the 12th part of the moon. She is in... Uh, she is in the 5th, 12th part of, of uh, Gemini, which is the Libra 12th part, and that corresponds to the 6th house of illness in Arius' chart with Pluto in it. So I think that shows Mr. Nermi's cancer. And of course, <clears throat> the prosecutor, Mr. Martinez, is uh, Mars in Gemini in Mr. Alexander's chart. So here are the solar returns for the year of death. You know, again, the process here would be to root them back to the nativity. Um, Mr. Alexander was having a Scorpio year in 2007. He was 30, about to turn 31. And Scorpio is in the rather morbid fourth house. Now, you know, we can do the annual cycle at the level of the month, too. And the actual date of the murder occurred during the Gemini month. And, of course, Gemini is a very... A bloody lethal sort of a house in his chart. I thought that was very interesting. But mainly, we can know the source of a lot of this trouble because Mercury, the significator, the winner of the marriage topic, is in the house of enemies, secret enemies, enemies that we underestimate. Right? There are a lot of features in this solar return which make it rather difficult. In Miss Arius's chart, she was having a Leo year, a fourth house year, which is rather morbid, as I've said, and in the solar return, um, Leo is in the 11th with Saturn in it. All right, And Jupiter, who also rules the death topic in her chart. Jupiter is in the third house of journeys. Very strong, right there with Pluto. Right? 
Look at her natal ascendant in the solar return, right? She's Taurus rising, of course. It's in the eighth of the solar return. She's going to be all about the death topic in this year. And she's got this detrimented Mars transiting through it with an exalted moon showing an automatic feeling for it, an automatic desire for it. So we can see how, how difficult this year was going to be for her. Already, you know, <clears throat> Travis in the shower getting his picture taken, that's in the 10th house. And so these solar returns are laying out the story. And finally, what happened that night? This is the event chart. And what's interesting, perhaps the most notable feature of the event chart, is that it's a perfect inversion of their, how, of their, natal, of their natal charts. Right? When the murder happened, and we're fortunate enough, to, well, I shouldn't say that, but the murder was actually re it was recorded on, on, on camera. We have time stamp, stamps of it. Take, one minute, Mr. Alexander's in the shower. Less than three minutes later, he's dead. All of it time stamped. So this event chart is on the money. There's no way the Ascendant could be anything other than Scorpio. So this chart is a perfect inversion of their charts. Their seventh house is rising. Both of their first house is setting. Their fourth house is culminating in the tenth. And their natal tenth house is anti-culminating in the fourth. So we have a perfect inversion. Jupiter is in fall. And retrograde, showing something ignored and disrespected in the third house of journeys. Jupiter for Miss Arius already represents a series of really, really crappy relationships and flings. <clears throat> but in the event chart, he's not only in fall and in a bad condition and representing and determined toward journeys, but he's also trining her natal Saturn, too. That doesn't help the situation. So, all in all... A lethal chart, a lethal setup, a, a lethal relationship, and a situation that could have been avoided. <clears throat> so I definitely believe that Mr. Alexander met his fate that night. But I also believe that there was a measure of uh, choice available to him that we, and by we I mean he and I as a team, cooperating as astrologer and seeker, could have planned for <clears throat> and could have possibly avoided. I feel that very strongly. And without this intervention of astrology as a wisdom system, without some intervention of a functional system of, of learning and wisdom, not a dean that he voluntarily accepted upon himself and then failed to obey, but rather a system of knowing and wisdom, had he had access to this, then I really do feel he would be alive today. I think that's the big lesson to be had from even embarking on this study to begin with. Thank you very much for watching, for hanging in there. Um, if you would like to contact me, feel free to drop me an email. You see the email here on the screen. Um, and also, people who subscribe to my Patreon at the level of $5 and above are entitled to 40% discounts on my consultations but not on video reports. Um, if you'd like a video report that is just like what you saw today, but obviously nowhere nearly so uh, lethal and kinky, then again, drop me a line and open up a dialogue. I would love to hear from you. Have a great day.